All right, guys, we are already to chapters 9 and 10 in our book, Kirby, Kirby McCook and the Jesus Chronicles. So let's find out what happens. Chapter 9 is called Jesus Stops a Terrorist. Zuri Claire is definitely not speaking to me. I said hi to her this morning, and she sort of lowered her eyebrows. Man, I guess I blew it with that note thing. <clears throat> All right, dudes. Remember, Jacob was worried about meeting Esau, but then they met and hugged it out. The brothers had both grown up a bit over the years. Their shenanigans were over, and they forgave each other. Yay! Later on, something sad happened. Jacob's wife, Rachel, became pregnant again, and the baby was born okay, but Rachel died. Jacob was totally sad. He named the new baby boy Benjamin, son of my right hand. In total, Jacob had 12 sons who would become leaders of 12 important tribes, the framework of the nation God was building. Years passed and Jacob's son Joseph went to Egypt and rose to become the second in command to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. He protected the whole family there, but that's a story for another time. Their descendants had lots of babies and many generations passed. A new Pharaoh, who'd never heard of Joseph, came to power in Egypt and did a totally cruel thing. He made all of Jacob's descendants become slaves, forcing them to make bricks of mud and straw. For 400 years, the Israelites were slaves. During this time, they came to be called Hebrews. Grandpa McCook told me the word Hebrews might mean people beyond the river or people who overcome. The new Pharaoh was like a terrorist who did something even more horrifying than slavery. He wasn't happy with how huge the Hebrew population was getting. He was worried that if there were too many of them, they might fight against the Egyptians and take off. So he ordered all newborn Hebrew boys to be thrown into the Nile River. Yep, girls could live, but baby boys were goners. During that horrible time, one family with a son, Aaron, and daughter, Miriam, had a new baby. Yep, a baby boy. They hid that kid for three months. But it got harder and harder. Ever tried to hide a baby? Well, don't. There's the diapers and crying and baby food and the... Did I say diapers? I'm telling you, it ain't easy. So they waterproofed a basket, put the baby inside, and placed a basket in the reeds along the Nile River. Miriam played along the riverbank so she could watch the basket. Just then, Pharaoh's daughter came to the riverbank to take a bath. This is Pharaoh. It's a picture of him. There weren't any showers or stuff back then, so the river was probably the best they could do. I can imagine the conversation between her and her attendants. Oh, girls, did you bring my favorite shampoo? Not that stuff made of papyrus. It smells like, what in the world is that? Pharaoh's daughter spotted the basket and sent a slave girl after it. Inside it was a brand new puppy. What? No, not a puppy. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Inside was a crying baby, and Pharaoh's daughter lifted him and looked at him up and down and said, Ooh, look it, a little itty-bitty baby. He's so cute. He's hungry. Yes, he is. Who's hungry? You are. Yes, you are. Pharaoh's daughter chose right then and there. This baby will live. Miriam thought quick. She, bur uh, she burst from the bulrushes, sprinted up to Pharaoh's daughter, and said, Hey there, ma'am. Want me to get a Hebrew woman to nurse him for you? Babies are a lot of work, you know. Feeding, burping, hiccuping, changing, chin wiping, barfing, nose wiping. Yeesh, Pharaoh's daughter said. Yes, go, now. Miriam ran, found her mother, and introduced her to Pharaoh's daughter as a baby nurse with excellent references. Pharaoh's daughter said, Look after this baby for me, and I'll pay you big money. How's that for hilarious? I love this part of the story. That little tyke, whose life was hanging by a thread moments earlier, was back in his mother's arms, and she'd get paid to look after him. Pharaoh's daughter named the baby Moses, meaning lifted out of the water. His biological parents raised him for the next few years. Then he lived in the palace and officially became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We aren't told exactly what Moses learned during those early years at home with his mom and dad, but I'm pretty sure they told him about God. Probably every chance they got, they whispered, Psst, God loves you. Make sure you don't ever forget about God. They had a hunch Moses would do important work for God, so they taught him good stuff, solid truth, loyalty, and knowledge right and knowledge of right and wrong. As an older boy and teenager and young man, Moses grew up in the palace. Those were important years too, years of education. 
I'm sure he learned all of the insider information about palace, li palace life. Probably how to hold his pinky finger when he ate grapes, how to negotiate with camel train drivers for exotic spices, how to pin an opponent with a dagger. He was trained to be a leader in Egypt. Moses lived in the palace until age 40. One day, while taking a walk, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. Moses was ticked. This Hebrew was his own countryman. Moses looked this way and that and thought nobody was watching. He jumped the Egyptian, killed him, and hid the body in the sand. But there were eyewitnesses to the murder, and they told Pharaoh. Moses ran for his life, and out in the outback he met Jesus. Did Moses get away? We'll find out next. Kirby's notes. Stick inside your brain. I am certain that God who became, who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finished in the day of Christ Jesus returns. Philippians 1.6. Want to read more? Read Exodus chapter 1 verses 1 through chapter 2 verse 10, Hebrew chapter 11 verse 23 through 27, and Psalm chapter 121 verses 7 and 8. Chapter 10 is called Jesus and the Bloody Lamb. I'll admit it, I'm miserable over a girl. I can't even figure out how to talk to her, but I saw her and Mason talking and laughing like it was easy as pie. Maybe I should just get up. <clears throat> After he murdered the Egyptian guy, Moses ran away to the land of Midian, where he met a man, man named Jethro who had seven daughters. Eventually, Moses married one of the daughters and got a job looking after Jethro's flock. Big change for Moses, from the palace to the outback. But Moses learned important life lessons over the next 40 years working as a shepherd, lessons he'd use later. How to find water, how to move stuff around in the desert, how to be patient and not murder people. He had to use that one a lot. Let's chart this out. Moses was trained to A, know God, B, understand Egypt, C, live in the desert. Put them together and what have you got? A dude perfectly suited to leave the Israelites out of slavery. But would he do it? Here's where Jesus, God the Son, enters the story. One afternoon out in the desert, Moses saw a bush that was on fire. The bush burned and burned, but it didn't burn up. Moses went closer to check it out. Then, from inside the burning bush, Jesus' voice called, Take off your sandals, Moses. You're standing on holy ground. Moses immediately went barefoot. Jesus said, My people are living in miserable slavery. I'm going to rescue them, and you can help. I'll lead them out of Egypt to the promised land. They won't be slaves anymore, and everybody will love it. So go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses was worried because he didn't know God's personal name. How would Moses convince the Israelites to follow if he didn't know the name of the one who told him to lead? God told Moses an amazing thing. My name is, I am who I am. Moses worked his mind around that. God's name means God exists. Period. God has always existed. He always will exist and exists right now. God is ever present. God always is. But Moses still wasn't ready to get on board with God's plan. Okay, but I'm not much of a talker, Lord. I've been out with the sheep for 40 years. All I can say to any all I can say anymore is bah. I'll be the judge of who can speak and who can't. Jesus said. After all, I'm the one who made mouths and tongues and all of that stuff. But I just don't want to. God, Moses whined. Please send someone else. Take your big brother Aaron. Jesus said. He speaks well, and I'll be, I'll be with both of you the whole time. Now get a move on. So Moses and Aaron did exactly what God told them. They walked up to Pharaoh and said, Look, dude, you can't keep these slaves anymore. God said so. You gotta set them free. God? Who's God? Pharaoh said. I don't know, God. I'm the Pharaoh and I'm more powerful than any God. You actually think so? Moses and Aaron said. Man, you are in for some real hard knocks. Just watch. Then God sent plagues on Egypt, one right after the other. First, the Nile River turned to blood. Then frogs hopped everywhere. Then came swarms of tiny flies called gnats. Then came bigger flies. Then all the farm animals died of plague. Then the Egyptians themselves got sick. Then came hail. Then grasshoppers swarmed and ate whatever was left of the crop after all the other stuff. Then it was completely dark for three straight days. It was a bad, bad time to live in Egypt. Sometimes after a plague, Pharaoh would say to Moses, Okay, I guess God really does exist. 
He's pretty powerful after all. I'll let the Israelites go free. Just take this blasted plague away. So God took the plague away. But then Pharaoh would change his mind. Nope, fooled you. The Hebrews are still my slaves. Tough darts, buddy. The very last plague was the most powerful of all. God announced that all the firstborn sons of Egypt would die. The angel of death would travel over the land and kill people, cattle, sheep, donkeys, any person or animal that was the first son in its family. There was only one way to be safe. God said to just take the lamb, the blood of a lamb, a perfect lamb with nothing wrong with it, and sprinkle it on the side and top of your door. The angel would see the blood and pass over the house. Again, Pharaoh didn't listen. So, an angel, following God's orders, went up and down every street in the city, every street in every city in Egypt. If the angel saw a lamb's blood on the door of a house, he passed over. But if not, then every firstborn son in that house died. Family after family didn't listen to God. A huge wail rose over all of Egypt. People screamed and moaned. Even Pharaoh lost his firstborn son. Finally, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Beat it! Scam! Take all these Israelites and go! Yeah, but this time, are you for reals? Moses and Aaron asked. Pharaoh nodded. So the Israelites left Egypt at last. Free. Remember the Passover lamb? The lamb who died in the place of others? That's a picture of Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Many years later, Jesus would die on the cross so people could be set free from far worse slavery the slavery of sin. Next, we'll meet some secret spies. Kirby's notes stick inside your brain. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which will lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Want to read more? Read Acts chapter 7, verses 30 through 36, Romans 5, 8, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Let's see what happens next. See you later, guys.